It's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. When the Reformation threatened the power of the Catholic Church and drew millions of people away from its clutches, Satan established a counter-Reformation designed to nullify the threat and reassert its position of dominance. At the Council of Trent from 1545 to 1563, a commission of cardinals was put together to clean up the Catholic Church and to reassert its position of authority as the only true Church of God. Fundamental to this movement was the establishment of new religious orders. The most famous order to be created at this time, and the one that has gone on to become the largest in the world, was the Society of Jesus, or as they are more commonly known, the Jesuits. They would become one of the most infamous organisations in history. It's important we explore the Jesuits because it gives us deep insight into the mind and tactics of our enemy, but for that same reason I want to preface it with a warning that the next few parts will be dealing with some very twisted and evil themes. The founder of the Jesuits was a man called Don Inigo Lopez, who was born into an extremely wealthy family in the Basque region of Spain in 1491. He later changed his name to Ignatius Loyola. As a young man, Loyola was said by police records to be proud, violent, vindictive and dangerous. His great life's ambition was to become a powerful military commander, which was going well until one particular battle where a cannonball broke one of his legs and heavily wounded the other. This event effectively ended his military ambitions. He was removed from the field of battle, underwent numerous painful surgical operations and spent a long time in recovery. During this period, Loyola had a nervous breakdown as he struggled to come to terms with the end of his army career and the end of his life's ambition. In this fragile mental state, as he lay there with little else to occupy his mind, he began reading a number of fanciful religious texts about the works of the Catholic saints. Particularly inspired by the life of St. Francis of Assisi, he set out to emulate his deeds and those of others like him. He began to envision Jesus as a type of great military commander, and thought that although his physical army career was over, he could instead become a kind of general in Jesus' army instead, the goal of which would be to capture the world. Now as a cripple, he made his way across Spain to the mountains of Montserrat, where there was a Benedictine monastery. Within this monastery was a sacred goddess idol called the Black Virgin of Montserrat, which he stood before in vigil for three days. There he committed himself and his work to her, by doing so, he committed himself to the demonic goddess Asherah. From here, he decided that he would go to Jerusalem and conquer the Muslim world for Catholicism. His ambitions were halted, however, as Barcelona had the plague and he was forced to stay in the small town of Manresa for ten months instead. For those ten months, he lived in a cave, torturing himself physically and mentally until he began to have dreams and visions. Through these hallucinations, he claimed that the secret doctrine of the Catholic Church was taught to him by a form in the air near him, and this form gave him much consolation because it was exceedingly beautiful. It somehow seemed to have the shape of a serpent and had many things that shone like eyes, but were not eyes. He received much delight and consolation from gazing upon this object, but when the object vanished, he became disconsolate. Here we see the telltale signs of a demonic cave revelation, exactly like that which Muhammad experienced. More explicitly than Muhammad's encounter, the being came in the form of a serpent rather than an angel of light.
similar to Muhammad, Loyola found himself prone to depression after contact. After the ten-month period in the cave, Loyola proceeded to Jerusalem, where he approached the Franciscan monks. They told him to go home as they did not want any political trouble. It was upon his return to Spain that he started formal training by studying theology at various universities. At this time he, along with a small band of companions, also started making disciples of others. While Loyola preached, it was noted that some of his female followers became so hysterically zealous that one fell senseless, another sometimes rolled about on the ground, another had been seen in the grip of convulsions or shuddering and sweating in anguish. Clearly demonic activity was at work following his cave experience and commitment to the demonic Asherah idol, and for the rest of his life he was known for having mystic powers. In the coming years, he would be thrown into jail twice under the suspicion that he was a member of the Almbrado, or as we know them, the Illuminati, and we'll discover more about them later. The description of people falling senseless and going into convulsions may remind you of scenes from Christian churches in recent times. To deal with that, I want to refer you to a three-part series called Kundalini Warning, which I'll provide links for below. Please watch all the way to the end for a balanced opinion. By 1534, Ignatius Loyola had six key companions, all of whom he had met at university, and they formed the initial military brotherhood of the Society of Jesus. On the morning of 15th of August, 1534, they met in the crypt of the Church of Our Lady of the Martyrs at Montmartre, and took solemn vows committing themselves to their lifelong work. As a man with an army background, Loyola created his order with the principles and disciplines that he had been used to as a soldier. The leader demanded the unquestioning obedience from his inferiors. Loyola was made the first superior general of the order, and they began the work of opposing the Reformation and re-establishing the dominance of the Catholic Church in Europe and around the world. They made their way to Rome where, in time, their society was accepted by the Pope, who at that time was Paul III. Paul III had seen the need of such a military order to repel the progress that the Protestant Reformation was making, as the Catholic Church seemed powerless by its own means. The Pope invested in them the authority too. Excommunicate all who would hinder or who do not aid the society, to confer orders, preach and administer the sacraments, to change their general, to absolve heretics as well as imprison the excommunicate, to exercise episcopal functions, to confirm, exercise, dispense, etc., to disguise themselves, to carry movable altars, give plenary indulgences, to live exempt, free from secular powers, taxes as well as jurisdiction, authority, sentence and command of any other ordinary delegate, judge magistrate from any search. In other words, the Jesuits were given authority from the Catholic Church to operate above the law and to employ any means necessary to do their work. With this remit, in time, the Jesuits became the most prominent and powerful of Catholic weapons against the Reformation. Key to Ignatius Loyola's order were something called the Spiritual Exercises. These were based on the experiences and secret teachings he had received whilst in the cave at Manresa. He basically made a template of what he had done in the cave to summon the serpent with the secret knowledge and then passed it on to his followers. These spiritual exercises formed the foundation of his entire movement. All Jesuits would have to go through them in order to bring themselves to the same kind of mind as Loyola had himself after ten months in the cave. They involve systematic meditation, prayer, contemplation, visualization and illumination and would lead to a trance-like state of ecstasy. By following these rituals, he and his followers were even seen to levitate off the floor. The spiritual exercises initiation would take 30 days and initiates were brought through them by a supervisor or director. For the entirety of that period, they were told what to think, how to feel, when to groan, what to sigh, what to imagine, and they were to cut off all normal human emotion throughout those experiences. By the end of the 30 days, the initiate was to have his mind broken like that of a horse, so that he was now ready to be utterly obedient in all things. An observer of the Jesuits wrote, Not only visions were prearranged, but also sights, inhalings, Breathing was noted down, the pauses and intervals of silence were written down like a music sheet. 
which meant that the man, being inspired or not, became a machine who had to sigh, sob, groan, cry, shout, or catch his breath at the exact moment and in the order which experience showed to be the most profitable. Using this method, Loyola needed only 30 days to break someone's will and reasoning. The Jesuit initiates, once brainwashed or programmed by the spiritual exercises and further training, were to become as puppets to their superiors. Their constitution states that the Jesuit must give instant compliance to those above them in the hierarchy, completely sacrificing their own will in the process. They were to be directed under divine providence by their superiors, just as if they were a corpse, which allows itself to be moved and handled in any way. Their constitution justifies this absolute and unquestioning obedience by claiming the general of the Jesuits is in the place of Jesus Christ. Like the Pope, the general has invested in himself spiritual authority for worldly power and control. In more than 500 places in the Jesuit constitution, it is taught that the Jesuits should see Jesus in their general. The blasphemy continues in the constitution saying, no constitution, declaration or any order of living can involve an obligation to commit sin, mortal or venial, unless the superior command it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ or by virtue of holy obedience, which shall be done in those cases or persons wherein it shall be judged to conduce the particular good of each or to the general advantage, and instead of the fear of offence, let the love and desire of all perfection succeed, that greater glory of Christ our Creator and Lord may follow. That nonsense just means that the Jesuit superiors can command an inferior to commit a sin in the name of Jesus Christ if they feel the end justifies the means, or if it leads to the greater glory of God in their eyes. Loyola even said, I will believe that the white that I see is black if the hierarchical church so defines it. The order operated on the basis of complete, blind, mechanical obedience to those who are higher up in the hierarchical structure. The entire organization in turn would be at the disposal of the Pope as an army of the most zealous and dedicated spiritual warriors for the Vatican. They specialized in warfare by stealth and deception to undermine the enemy, the enemy being true Christians of the Reformation. We gain the fullest understanding of their deceitfully wicked intentions if we read their oath, and so we'll go through that in the next part. But before we leave the spiritual exercises, another warning against deception. Paul wrote to Timothy that towards the end of time, people would begin to abandon the faith and instead follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Here are the words of popular American pastor Tony Campolo in his letter called Becoming Actualized Christians. I learned about this way of having a born-again experience from reading Catholic mystics, especially the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola. Ignatius, a founder of the Jesuit order, was once a soldier and it was only when he spent a long time in a hospital bed recovering from a battle wound that his heart and mind focused on God. Like most Catholic mystics, he developed an intense desire to experience a oneness with God. Gradually, he came to feel an intense yearning for the kind of spiritual purity that he believed would enable him to experience the fullness of God's presence within. Tony Campolo goes on to say, After the Reformation, we Protestants left behind much that was troubling about Roman Catholicism of the 15th century. I am convinced we left too much behind. The methods of praying employed by the likes of Ignatius have become precious to me. With the help of some Catholic saints, my prayer life has deepened. We know that behind the Catholic saints are demons, and we know that the spiritual exercises are satanic. Beware the emergent church movement in particular, which we'll look at later in some depth. Satan is trying to sneak his poison into Christianity, and this is why it's so important we study this stuff so that we're not led astray through lack of knowledge, and so that we learn to recognize deception and evil, even when it comes disguised as an angel of light through the lips of people who claim to be on God's side. We're now going to read the Jesuit Oath to gain an insight into exactly how they went about trying to destroy the work of the Reformation. When I warned that we'd be going into some twisted and disturbing stuff, this is one of the things I had in mind. 
It's an extremely disturbing document, but it's important to go over it, as it doesn't just give us insight into the Jesuits. By proxy, it gives us deep insight into the mind of our demonic enemy as a whole, and the tactics that Satan may still employ today against us. Remember, he has no new tricks. Incidentally, I'll post a copy of this in the notes section of the Fuel Project Facebook page if you want to read it again. My son, you have been taught to act the dissembler, amongst the Roman Catholics to be a Roman Catholic, and to be a spy even among your own brethren, to believe no man, to trust no man, among the reformers to be a reformer, among the Huguenots to be a Huguenot, among the Calvinists to be a Calvinist, among the Protestants generally to be a Protestant, and obtaining their confidence to seek even to speak from their pulpits, and to denounce with all vehemence in your nature our holy religion and the Pope, and even to descend so low as to become a Jew amongst the Jews, that you might be enabled to gather together all information for the benefit of your order as a faithful soldier of the Pope. You have been taught to insidiously plant the seeds of jealousy and hatred between states that were at peace, and incite them to deeds of blood involving them in war with each other, and to create revolutions and civil wars in communities, provinces and countries that were independent and prosperous, cultivating the arts and the sciences, and enjoying the blessings of peace. To take side with the combatants, and to act secretly in concert with your brother Jesuit, who might be engaged on the other side, but openly opposed to that which you might be connected, only that the church might be the gainer in the end, in the conditions fixed in the treaties for peace, and that in the end justifies the means. You have been taught your duties as a spy to gather all statistics, facts and information in your power from every source, to ingratiate yourself into the confidence of the family circle of Protestants and heretics of every class and character, as well as that of the merchant, the banker, the lawyer, amongst the schools and universities, in parliament and legislatures, and in the judiciaries and councils of state, and to be all things to all men for the Pope's sake, whose servants we are unto death. You have received all your instructions heretofore as a novice, a neophyte, and have served as a coadjutor, confessor and priest, but you have not yet been invested with all that is necessary to command in the army of Loyola in the service of the Pope. You must serve the proper time as the instrument and executioner as directed by your superiors, for none can command here who has not consecrated his labours with the blood of the heretic, for without the shedding of blood no man can be saved. Therefore, to fit yourself for your work and make your own salvation sure, you will, in addition to your former oath of obedience to your order and allegiance to the Pope, repeat after me. I promise that, and declare that I will, when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war, secretly or openly, against all Protestants and liberals as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth, and that I will spare neither age, sex or condition, and that I will hang, burn, waste, boil, flay, strangle and bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs and wombs of their women and crush their infants' heads against the walls in order to annihilate forever their execrable race. That when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poisoned cup, the strangulating cord, the steel of the poniard or the leaden bullet, regardless of the honour, rank, dignity or authority of the person or persons, whatever may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed to do so by any agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith, the Society of Jesus. By reading these words we gain a full appreciation of their shocking tactics, which can be summed up like this. Their intention was to become part of the faith, system, culture or group that they intended to destroy. Then from within they would sow seeds of hate and division. Their method was to present themselves as one thing on the surface, but to be secretly working away with each other for a very different purpose behind the scenes. They would sometimes pretend to be enemies on opposing sides in public, but behind the scenes they were actually cohorts, working together towards the same goal. This type of attack is sometimes referred to as becoming a fifth column, meaning that the most effective way to attack something is not from the north or the south or the east or the west, but from within. Cicero once said, A nation can survive its fools and even the ambitious, but it cannot survive treason from within, 
An enemy at the gates is less formidable, for he is known and he carries his banners openly. But the traitor moves among those within the gates freely, his sly whispers rustling through all the alleys, heard in the very halls of government itself. For the traitor appears not traitor, he speaks in the accents familiar to his victims, and he wears their face and their garments, and he appeals to the baseness that lies deep in the hearts of all men. He rots the soul of a nation, he works secretly and unknown in the night, to undermine the pillars of a city, he infects the body politic, so that it can no longer resist. A murderer is less to be feared. The fifth column tactic is, of course, a trademark of Satan. It was the very tactic he used to persuade a third of the angels to fall with him and to become his army of demons. He went around whispering in the ears of anyone who would listen to turn them against God. More recently, ex-witches have spoken of being assigned to local churches by their coven with the aim of being involved in the congregation on the surface, but all the while secretly working against it from within, frustrating its aims and unity. If something is attacked from without, it will put up its defences and fight back. But if, by using deceit, the attacker can become part of the thing it wishes to destroy and gains the trust of those involved, they can take it down from within. But could we really expect any human being to carry out the acts described in this monstrous Jesuit oath? Well, remember that the spiritual exercises were designed to eliminate all human emotion and to turn the men into machines. And just as demonic influence was so clearly at work in Loyola's cave experience, so they are involved in the spiritual exercises. H. Bomer in Les Jesuits writes, We imbue unto him spiritual forces which he would find very difficult to eliminate later. These forces can come up again to the surface, sometimes after years of not even mentioning them, and become so imperative that the will finds itself unable to oppose any obstacle and has to follow their irresistible impulse. In other words, through the spiritual exercises, the Jesuit initiate becomes possessed and finds themselves compelled to act according to the will of these demonic forces within. Because Jesuit actions are centred on blind obedience to their superiors, they are told that they will never be held accountable for anything they do, not even by God. They are absolved of all personal responsibility as they become mere puppets for those that are higher up in the hierarchy. A professor told a student who was studying under him to become a Catholic priest, You will never have to give an account to God for actions you do by the order of your legitimate superiors. If they were to deceive you, being themselves deceived, they alone would be responsible for the error you have committed. Your sin would be imputed to you as long as you follow the golden rule that is a base for all Christian philosophy and perfection, humility and obedience. See how deceitful this is. The superiors are basically saying, you'll never have to give an account of your actions to God, don't worry about it. This allows them to perpetrate any act in the belief that they are beyond judgment. If their superior tells them to carry out a murder, they think that if they obey, then God will not hold them accountable and will instead blame the superior. This is one method the hierarchy uses to overcome or bypass the conscience of an individual. When you combine this with the spiritual exercises that have taught them to suppress human emotion and imbue them with demons, you can see how they would become capable of some extreme acts of violence and anything else for that matter. A second vital principle for Jesuits can be summed up in the phrase, the end justifies the means. Remember this one, it's very important. Before this maxim, the ideas of absolute right and wrong completely vanish. Conceivably, there is no crime or atrocity that is not allowed as long as it is for the greater glory of God. In fact, the sins that achieve the right result become holy in the eyes of the Jesuit, no matter how disgusting. You can lie, cheat, steal, rape or murder, but if the ends are the right ones in their eyes, then the means are justified. This exact concept also exists in Islam, where lying, deception, murder and other atrocities become acceptable if it furthers the cause of Allah on the earth. A third twisted principle of the Jesuits is probabilism. 
If a Jesuit has in mind to do something but knows it is very probably illegal, if he can find the merest hint that it may not be, he is allowed to continue with his action. For example, if he consults 100 teachers or doctors about his intended action and 99 say that it would be unlawful, but then one tells him that it may not be, he can act on that 1% probability that it is in fact lawful. In fact, if the Jesuit can imagine any reason in his own mind why his action may not be unlawful, however unlikely, this frees him to do it. It's a form of self-deception, lying to yourself to try to keep the conscience clear. Fourthly, there is the idea of directing the intention. This is the idea that if the person meditates on something holy while they perpetrate something evil, the soul contracts no guilt or stain. Therefore, the Jesuit can kill someone or lie or cheat or steal, but as long as he is focusing on something holy at the time in his mind, their soul remains white as snow. Again, such is the depth of deceit within the Jesuit system that they deceive even themselves. Fifthly and finally, there is the doctrine of equivocation or mental reservation. This policy allows the Jesuits to follow a secret policy while stating something completely different to the outside world. This is directly from the mysteries where secret doctrines and purposes were hidden under double meanings and secret symbols that seem quite innocent to the uninitiated. A Jesuit quoted, It is permitted to use ambiguous terms, leading people to understand them in a different sense from that in which we understand them. A man may swear that he never did something, though he actually did, meaning within himself that he did not do so on such a day, or before he was born, or under any circumstances, while the words he employs may have no such sense as would discover his meaning. He goes on to say, It is the intention that determines the quality of the action, and one may avoid falsehood if, after saying or denying something aloud, then add something under his breath that, if true, would make his statement the truth. So take this example. A Jesuit murders a man on a Thursday, and the police take him in for questioning and ask him if he murdered the man in question. The Jesuit replies, I did not murder him, which is obviously a lie because he did, but then under his breath or mentally he adds the words, on Friday. These inaudible words that he whispered to himself after the initial lie have now made the statement true. By doing this, Jesuits can permit perjury and in their own eyes remain blameless. The Jesuits expanded quickly around Europe. One of the primary ways in which they went about reclaiming some of the ground that had been lost to the Protestant reformers was to establish schools of education in various locations. They went for control of the information flows imagining, quite rightly, that by controlling education they could control knowledge and therefore control the worldviews and mindsets of coming generations. If you go to the Jesuit Boston College website today, you'll see a part where they admit when in 1547 Ignatius was asked to open a school in Sicily for young men who were not Jesuits, he seems to have seen the opportunity as a powerful means of forming the mind and the soul. To bring people to God, he sought to form those who, in their turn, would form or influence many others. These schools that catered for children of all ages soon spread across the world as part of a covert campaign to turn people back to Rome. The key to it was that unlike other Catholic institutions, the Jesuit schools actively encouraged Protestant children to enrol. This tactic gave them an opportunity to indoctrinate future generations with the rites, ceremonies and symbols of Rome. They particularly wanted to target the children of rich and influential Protestant families because they knew that what was taught to them would have a trickle-down effect on the rest of society. Like Jezebel herself, the Jezebel spirit goes for the powerful man who will influence others. Jesuits also sent missionaries to far-flung places in the world like China, placing great emphasis on the importance of assimilating themselves into their culture. By educating themselves on the language and religion of these places, they could become teachers of the people and work their way into positions of influence. They were incredibly committed, hard-working and disciplined in these tasks, pouring out their lives for the furtherance of their cause. 
Wherever they went, they consistently compromised their own message with the local pagan practices of the area to get a foothold, just like they'd done in Rome itself. When they returned to Europe from these far-flung places, they brought back with them the occult and pagan ideas that they'd picked up there. In Britain, the Jesuits made use of fifth column tactics. They started filtering into the country in the 1560s, and almost immediately they were found preaching from pulpits disguised as Church of England ministers. In 1568, a Jesuit priest posing as a Church of England minister accidentally dropped a secret copy of instructions on how to undermine and destroy the Church of England. After a search of his lodgings, further documents were discovered in his boots, including a license from the Jesuits and a bull from the Pope Pius, which authorised him to preach whatever was necessary to inflame animosities and widen divisions. They saw no better way to demolish churches than to infiltrate it in the guise of a minister who could introduce divisive false doctrines and ceremonies from the pulpit. The Jesuits also plotted to kill Queen Elizabeth I on many occasions so that the country could be returned to Rome. The Spanish Armada of 1588 was one such attempt to sail against Britain and overthrow the Queen who was seen as heretical and illegitimate by Rome. The Spanish Armada was defeated, but true to the Jesuit oath, that which could not be achieved in the open was pursued in secret. After Elizabeth I died and James I took to the throne, Jesuits attempted to blow up the Houses of Parliament in 1605, the infamous November V gunpowder plot led by Guy Fawkes, an event we celebrate in Britain every year. There were also murmurings and suspicions that the Jesuits were responsible for the Great Fire of London in 1666, although there seems to be little hard and fast evidence to support the theory. There was simply a mysterious book written in 1667 by a man claiming to be a Catholic Christian, in which he portrayed the Pope as fanning the flames that ravaged the city. In truth, the Jesuits were largely frustrated in Britain, but they did have more success in Europe. Having established themselves in Italy, Spain, Portugal and Austria, they set their sights on Germany, the birthplace of the Reformation. There they gained influence with the rulers and initiated campaigns of persecution against Christians. In keeping with their oath to stir up division and bloodshed in countries that were previously enjoying peace and prosperity for the sake of the Catholic Church, this persecution of Christians led to much disruption, war and bloodshed around Europe. They reignited the persecution against Protestants in Germany, leading to the Thirty Years' War of 1618. Although Protestant Sweden stepped in to stop Germany from being returned to Catholic darkness, it left the country in ruins for a long time afterwards. In the neighbouring Austro-Hungarian Empire, Jesuits were so influential that they virtually controlled the emperor at the time. Having this power, they came pretty close to purging the region of true Christianity. In Poland, which was a major European power in the mid-16th century due to their embracing of the Reformation, Jesuits also became enormously influential. This influence led to a decline in national well-being and disastrous policies towards neighbours that eventually led to their annihilation. Entry into France was slower, but was achieved by the formation of educational institutions. Jesuits were implicated in the assassination of the French King Henry III in 1589 and his successor, Henry IV, in 1610. They believed it was their right to kill any heretical monarch. They took the initials INRI, which biblically represented the Roman inscription above Jesus' head on the cross, meaning Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, and gave it a double hidden meaning which meant it is just to annihilate impious rulers. If you read their oath, you'll know that they paid no respect to rank or position. The French king, Louis XIV, was more to the Jesuits' liking, though. Louis had a Jesuit confessor from childhood whose influence turned him into a fanatical bigot, unleashing terrible persecution against Protestants. Louis also led an immoral life, and the Jesuit confessor made careful use of his secrets to have him trembling at his feet for forgiveness. Hello friends, this is TechSmarts. Welcome to another edition of Power of Prophecy. Well, today we're going to be look, looking at the uh, largest uh, so-called Christian church in the world. About a billion people or so, it all depends on who you talk to. From Rome itself, the Vatican, comes the Pope and his Korea. And today we're going to be talking about the Pope of Rome, the uh, Vatican, uh, and this new Pope. Pope Francis. 
Now, uh, Pope Francis is gaining a lot of popularity over in Europe and maybe around the world. He comes from, uh, I believe, Argentina. I'll have to make sure of that in just a moment with my guest. But uh, he's got a fresh face, and he seems to be a, a, a nice man. But he's already said some things that have startled uh, a lot of uh, O-line Catholics. I don't know why they would be startled, because evidently uh, these things have been said before in many other ways. But he's saying them in fresh ways that sort of, well, they surprise you. My guest today is the author of Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great. You know, Mystery Babylon the Great is an incredible mystery. Revelation 18 talks about uh, Babylon the Great. And it's the system that spreads around the world in the last days uh, and uh, may even produce the Antichrist. And we're pretty close to that age, aren't we? But the question is, what power does the Pope have? What has he said recently? And why did uh, Pope Benedict leave office before he, well, before he died? So we, now we have two popes. One is the Pope Emeritus Benedict, who lives at the Vatican apartment. And we have Pope Francis. And we have today a very special guest. Ed, are you there? I am. All right. Well, listen, you know, we've been offering your book for quite a while, Edward Henry. And you say you're going to track the beast from the synagogue to the Vatican. So we, we have the, the Jews that are somehow, uh, well, would you call it uh, integrated in with the Vatican? Well, the, the, uh, the Vatican. Uh, is, as you know, the headquarters for the Roman Catholic Church. And the Roman Catholic Church is a a crypto-Jewish, that is, it is a concealed uh, uh, Jewish religion. So it, they, they present themselves as a Gentile church. Their doctrines, however, are, are, are Jewish, and in essence, they are Babylonian, because Judaism flows from Babylon, and that Babylonian doctrine has found its way into the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, it is the uh, it makes up the pillars of the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church. The the, uh, the present Pope, Pope Francis, uh, he is uh, a Jesuit, uh, and uh, interestingly enough, the the Jesuits were founded uh, by Ignatius Loyola, uh, who was a Murano Jew, mm -hmm. uh, and. The, uh, the Jesuits are a crypto-Jewish uh, organization from the start. So they began uh, with the uh, Jew uh, founding them, uh, Ignatius Loyola. Uh, <laughs> he was probably, as you said, a crypto-Jew uh, because he stayed a Jew. You know, it doesn't matter in what uh, uh, country that, uh, or nation that they're in, the, the Jews stay, they stay Jews. And... They have, uh, they really don't even have dual loyalty. They only have loyalty to their nation. And, uh, it might, right. might be formed as Israel or may not be. But, so we, we have now, we, let's just start, let's go back in time. We're going to be looking at Pope Francis in some detail, but I'd like to look at the Jesuit order because the, the Catholic Church was having a lot of problems at the time because Martin Luther had come up and we had a, a, a Reformation. Uh, the Protestant churches were forming everywhere all around Europe. And so the, the Pope was concerned that he was losing a lot of people. Uh, and before that, you know, he had a, had an iron hand, but now suddenly, uh, people were rebelling against him. And so he began with, uh, Tor Torquemada, didn't he? And he led the Inquisition and began to force people back into a mold. Yes. So Torquemada, now, Torquemada was also Jewish, I understand, a crypto-Jew. Mm -hmm. So we have a Jew, and the Pope used uh, Torquemada to torture people. So all those tools of the Inquisition, the Iron Maiden and all those things. And then uh, evidently along comes um, this uh, guy, Ignatius Loyola. Now, what? What? he was a Spanish Morano, a Spanish Jew. His family had been forced to, uh, at that time, become um, so-called Christians. A lot of those uh, Murano Jews, they would just uh, practice their Judaism secretly and in their homes, and then they would, you know, go to church 
on Sunday and uh, in their mind they were they were just blaspheming Jesus Christ I suppose but anyway back to uh, uh, the Jesuits Loyola went to see the Pope in Rome and said I would like to start a new order now he was a very he evidently was very prominent wasn't he a, a Spanish general well he uh, he was very influential and in fact uh, he was um, he was brought before the Pope during the Inquisition uh, because of his influence and he swore fealty to the Pope and it was uh, Pope Paul III who formally approved the Jesuits as a Catholic order in, uh, on around 1540 mm. and that established the Jesuits as a Catholic order and the Jesuits are unique among all Catholic orders uh, they do not report to the cardinal uh, of their district. They report directly to the Pope. It is the militia of the Pope. Mm. And so they have allegiance only to the Pope. Wow. So they're, they're a worldwide group, correct? Yes. Okay. They're, they're a worldwide group. They have a leader. And he's sort of informally, or is it formally, <laughs> called the Black Pope. That's right. The Black because, Pope. Because uh, the... He is really, uh, in many respects, the real power uh, in the Vatican. Hmm. The, they, they're very influential, uh, and the, their influence uh, comes to a great extent through their um, financial power. Uh, these, uh, it started out as it was an organization of Murano Jews. Ignatius of Loyola was a Murano Jew. His uh, uh, Linnaeus, who took over after uh, Ignatius of Loyola died, he was also a Murano Jew, and so the organization uh, is is crypto Jewish. It, it, on its surface, it appears to be Gentile. On its surface, it, it appears to be uh, a a Catholic order, but its allegiance is really uh, to Jew Jewish uh, to Judaism and to the Jewish race. Mm. The um, as they view it. Uh, now, I don't, I don't view Jews as, as being a race, uh, necessarily. Uh, I believe it is a religion, uh, but that's a, a discussion for another time. But they, that's how they view themselves. Now, now, evidently, uh, from what I've read, the, the Order of the Illuminati, which was founded in 1776, by also another uh, uh, Jesuit Jew, wasn't he, uh, Adam Weishaupt? That's right. So, you, um, man, you, yeah. go, you go from the... the uh, Jesuits right to the uh, right to the order of the Illuminati in 1776 in Weishaupt. So you still have the Jesuits. Uh, a crypto Jew was ahead of that group too. That, that's right. Um, and Weishaupt was actually a front man. The Illuminati was actually the person behind that was Lorenzo Rico, who was the Jesuit general. The Jesuits, recall at that time, had just been suppressed by the Vatican. Uh, the Jesuits were involved in so much uh, nefarious uh, political uh, uh, subversion of countries that the political pressure came to be such that the Vatican uh, found it necessary to suppress the uh, uh, the Jesuits. Uh, and just to, just to give you an idea of, of the type of pressure that was being brought, there it was an. Uh, let's see, I'll, I'll read to you from an indictment in 1762 by the French Parliament. Now, this is something that's not taught in history books, uh, but basically, uh, this indictment called the Jesuits uh, and their doctrine perverse. They said that they were destroyers of all religious and, and honest principles, insulting to Christian morals, pernicious to, pernicious to civil society, hostile to the rights of a nation, uh, and they said they maintain the worst kind of corruptions in men's hearts. And other nations as well as France were putting pressure uh, on the Vatican. And uh, it was uh, 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 Pope Clement XIV who finally uh, suppressed uh, the, uh, uh, the Jesuits. And when a secret organization is suppressed, they find it necessary to, uh, uh, to then go underground and... Uh, and create basically a sister organization to keep their uh, uh, their plans in motion. 
So, and that's what they did with the Illuminati. Uh, they were suppressed in 1773. The Illuminati uh, came about in 1776, as is alleged. And uh, the... Uh, uh, they immediately began attacking the Catholic Church because now that they were suppressed, they viewed the Catholic Church as their enemy. Uh, and they, they were the secret um, uh, society that was behind the uh, brutal French Revolution where you had 300,000 people that were uh, uh, massacred in a godless orgy of, of violence. And they were behind that. Uh, they attacked the Catholic Church, um, and the Catholic Church uh, learned its lesson, okay? On a, uh, uh, in 1814, the Jesuits were restored as a Catholic order by Pope Pius the, uh, the Seventh. And um, that was, uh, those who were in the know in, uh, in the political realm knew the danger of the Jesuits. Uh, in a letter that John Adams wrote to Thomas Jefferson, uh, he said, If ever an association of people deserved eternal damnation on this earth and in hell, it is the Society of Loyola. And Jefferson responded, Like you, I object to the Jesuits' reestablishment, which makes light give way to darkness. So they understood uh, very clearly the dangers posed by the Jesuits. And, of course, they did not miss a beat. As soon as they were reestablished as, a, as an order, they began their political subversion of various countries, uh, which gave rise to them being expelled from Russia in 1820, uh, Belgium and Portugal in 1834. Um, they, were, um, they were expelled from Spain three times in 1820, 1835, and 1868. They were expelled from Germany in 1872, Guatemala in 1872, Mexico in 1873, Brazil in 1874, Ecuador in 1875, Colombia in 1875, Costa Rica in 1884, and, uh, and they were expelled from France twice, 1881 and 1901. In fact, they caused the Swiss Civil War in 1847, and as a result, uh, they were banished from, uh, from Switzerland, and up until 2000, the year 2000, the Swiss Constitution, Article 51 of the Swiss Constitution, forbade the Jesuits from engaging in any cultural or educational activity in Switzerland. Uh, however, in the year 2000, they ratified a new constitution uh, and they um, uh, repealed uh, the Article 51. Well, Adam, uh, interesting, as I was doing research uh -huh. uh, and I was trying to pull up Article 51, uh, on the Internet, where you had the Swiss Constitution, they listed Article 51, but they did not post it. Hmm. They would not post the verbiage online. Uh, and as I was in the process of tracking down that article, and this was back around the year 2000, uh, Switzerland uh, uh, repealed uh, that article. Well, now, you know, <laughs> I'm just thinking about this. Just like the Jews have uh, been kicked out from... It you know, almost every country on earth at one time or another. Uh, and I don't think the Jews were kicked out because they were a, a choir boys, do you? So so we have the Je the Jesuits. I mean, there are many Catholic orders, but I've never heard of one that was kicked out of country after country. And even the Vatican itself said these people are revolutionaries, they're dangerous, uh, and mm -hmm. began to suppress them. So, boy, we... we uh, as I said, these are not choir boys, are they? Now, what, what exactly, no. what exactly uh, have the Jesuits done over the centuries that caused them to be so feared and so uh, suppressed and persecuted? Well, they. Uh, um, I mean, was it the Re they, Re Revolutionary Activity? They were, if they were crypto Zionist, of course, they were trying to overthrow they, morality and Christianity everywhere. If you if you want to. Uh, uh, if you want to look at an example uh, of what they've done, uh, then one example would be the French Revolution. Ah. Um, the, you know, they, they have their, let me give you another example. The, in, um, this would have been, oh, in the 1500s, mm -hmm. uh, or early 1500s, yeah, 1500s, when, when uh, King James uh, came to the throne. Mm -hmm. They uh, they saw him as a clear threat to the Vatican did. And so Jesuit conspirators, and this was run by the Jesuits, uh, 
decided to pack the the basement of the parliament with gunpowder. This is called the gunpowder plot. Oh yes. And they were going to blow up parliament, killing all of parliament and the king. Uh, the plot was discovered, mm -hmm. and the um, the conspirators were were hung. But it was a Jesuit plot from beginning to end, and wow. to this day. Um, it is celebrated as Guy Fawkes Day in England. Yeah, However, that, in the United States and throughout the world, it's unknown. Well, you know, they had that's that something that they that they teach in history books. So that's just a, that's another example of the the type of subversion uh, that the Jesuits engage in. Well, you know, they had a movie uh, recently with uh, oh, I forget, I guess Natalie Portman. Uh, and all, mm -hmm. they, this guy had a you know he had this mask over his face. He was he was Guy Fawkes. In England, uh -huh. and of course he finally did blow up the parliament, uh, which caused uh, uh, a lot of uh, you know people around the world now wear that same Guy Fawkes mask, and there the, many of them are anarchists uh, to this day, uh, taken yeah. over from the Jesuits. Now they also had something to do with the foundations of the United States. I mean the Jesuits were very big in uh, North and South America, Canada, the United States, and and even down uh, in Brazil and Argentina. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I recall uh, reading a little bit about Bill Clinton's life, how he went to Georgetown, a Jesuit school, right? Yes. But now let me let me just uh, tell people. I'm sorry I didn't uh, identify uh, you better, uh, Edward. I guess I just assume that people knew of you because we we've been offering your uh, your your fine books for so long. But Edward Henry is an attorney, a very noted attorney. Uh, and that's my guest today. And not only that, but he's a graduate of Notre Dame University, a Catholic school. Uh, and, uh, aren't you also a, a, a Loyola graduate, uh, for, in law school? Uh, well, I went to a Jesuit law school. But okay. not Loyola. Oh, not Loyola. Okay. I know they yeah. still, they still have a couple of, uh, universities, law schools and such in America, uh, called Loyola. So they, they honor him. And, but, but anyway, back to America, I think the first, um, the first uh, cardinal was a Jesuit named Carroll, wasn't it? Or, uh, I believe it was Carroll from Washington, D.C. He actually gave the land on which our, our capital sits today. So he evidently knew uh, Washington and Jefferson and all those people. But uh, I believe he, was, uh, he, was, he went to, uh, to Rome, and they made the guy a, a Jesuit cardinal, if I'm not mistaken. Now, correct me on that if I'm wrong. So, uh, well, I, yeah, I, um, I'm not that familiar with the, uh, with the land grant for the capital. Okay. Well, I know he owned the land, so I think he, he gave it, either gave it or for a very cheap price that, that, that they built the capital on. Uh, and they built it, you know, in the form of a, many Masonic symbols. But he himself, uh, I think there was another cardinal at the time that came over named Bellarmine. But, uh, yeah, I think, uh, well, in any case, isn't it interesting that, Jez that Georgetown is a Jesuit school, uh, and uh, our former president Bill Clinton, who, as you and I know, was a Baptist, supposedly was a member mm -hmm. of the Southern Baptist uh, Church. Uh, that was the only university that he applied for out of high school. I understand. Now, isn't that interesting? Why would he want to go to Georgetown University, a very noted school? But uh, in, uh, right out of Washington D.C., remember you and I were there at that conference uh, on the on the boat uh, a couple of years back. But isn't that interesting that Georgetown is so powerful? But I understand he met a a Jesuit um, there named Carol Quigley. Yes. But anyway, I'm, I'm getting off into other subjects. Maybe I shouldn't, but but I remember at the time that Bill Clinton was so impressive as a student that a that a Jesuit priest. Asked him to go to dinner, and they went out to eat together. And as a student, the Jesuit priest said, "We want to recruit you to be a Jesuit priest." Invited Bill Clinton to be a Jesuit priest. Of course, I guess Bill Clinton uh, knew uh, where his bread and you know butter was, and so he decided not to. But isn't that interesting that they recognized, I think, the sinful, immoral nature of Bill Clinton and asked him to join the Jesuits? Sure. Sure. Just it shows they know sin, don't they, uh, Ed? Oh yeah, boy. Oh yeah. But Ed Henry is a Christian. Uh, he was born again. Uh, he's left the Catholic Church, and he's exposed it in this 
incredible uh, book, Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great, which you expose both the Jews and the Catholic Church at the same time. You're taking on quite a task, Ed. <laughs> well, it, it, uh, the, the facts uh, uh, speak for themselves. And so the, um, while the book took a lot of research, the facts just come to the surface. It's not any creative writing on my part. The evidence speaks for itself. The evidence is ineluctable that, in fact, the Roman Catholic Church is basically Judaism for Gentiles. And, you know, that's what you're looking at when you look at the Roman Catholic Church, which is why, by the way, the Murano Jews felt quite comfortable in the Roman Catholic Church. Um, the liturgy of the Roman Catholic Church uh, was quite acceptable to them mm -hmm. because it follows very closely their Judaic beliefs. And so that's why over the centuries they keep going into the Catholic Church with the Jewish Kabbalah and, and the Talmud and all that. It's, it seems like they just keep drawing closer and closer together uh, in, in various periods. Well, let's talk about this Pope uh, that we've got now, Pope Francis. Mm -hmm. Now, he comes from Argentina, right? Yes. Okay, so now that's that's interesting in itself, but he not he the first Jesuit Pope? I can't say that for sure. I, I think he is, but I, I could be wrong about that. Mm -hmm. But in, in any case, now he he's not the he's not the black pope, obviously. So he was very high up as a cardinal in the Jesuit order. But now that he's become the the pope, uh, I don't know how that would work. How, how would he would he? Uh, I guess the well, he, he is he is um, he is under the Jesuit general. So the Jesuit general actually has authority over him Wow! as a Jesuit. He has sworn fealty to the, in fact, if you read carefully the Jesuit oath, um, while they do swear allegiance to the Pope, their mm -hmm. allegiance to the, to the uh, Jesuit general is superior where there is any conflict to the uh, their allegiance to the Pope. Now, Pope John Paul II came in, and evidently he fired Pedro Arupe, the, the Jesuit uh, general, the black pope. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't, that was one of the first things he did, which I thought was sort of shocking. Uh, but uh, in any case, he did. But uh, now we still we still have a black pope, and we have this pope uh, who calls himself Francis. Uh, so I guess he, he must love the environment and the, the animals and all that, like uh, uh, you know Francis did, a bishop. Uh, back back when, but here's what I I want to know. You know th this this statement that he made. He seems you know to be a nice guy. He he washes the feet of both women and men, which is you know something that I guess they do once a year or something. Have a foot washing ceremony. Nothing nothing bad about that, Ed. But let me read to you from the press what it says here. It says Pope Francis suggests atheist good deeds. Get them to heaven. Now he just had become Pope, right? Uh, so here we have on May 24, 2013. Here's what the Washington Times said: Pope Francis has sparked a religious debate with comments made earlier this week confirming atheists can indeed go to heaven. Now Christian teaching generally holds that belief in Jesus and not good deeds grants eternal life, but the Pope in a morning mass on Wednesday suggested that belief and faith were not the biggest factors. Now hold up just a minute because I'm going to ask you a question about that one. The Pope suggested that belief and faith were not the biggest factors. CNN reported that the Pope had said uh, at this mass, quote, the Lord has redeemed all of us. All of us. He repeated it. All of us with the blood of Christ. All of us. So he said all of us three times. Not just Catholics, everyone. And then he, he appeared to be talking to actually to God. He said, Father, the atheist, even the atheist, everyone. We must meet one another doing good. Wow. But I don't believe, Father, I am an atheist, but do good. We will meet one another there. In other words, the atheist is asking the Father in heaven, I don't believe. I am an atheist. And God responds to him, but do good. We will meet one another there. 
Now, Roy Speckhart, the executive director of the American Humanist Association, like this. Okay, he's an atheist. I gather from this statement, said Mr. Speckhart, that his view of the world's religious and philosophical diversity is expanding. Now, I want to ask you, Ed Henry, is since you left the the uh, Notre Dame and your uh, Catholic law school, would you say that your uh, your religious and philosophical uh, uh, diversity is expanding? <laughs> I mean, are you expanded or? <laughs> No, no, it's significantly no. narrowed. It's narrowed. Okay, that's that's a you know, that's an interesting thing to say, isn't it? That, that the head of the American Human Association, atheist, commends the Pope, and he says, "Hearing this from the leader of the Catholic Church is quite heartening." I mean, he's very pleased about this. Well, I, I, I don't know. Should we be pleased, uh, Ed? Well, we shouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, the devil is very, very subtle. And if you read in Genesis 3.1, it says, The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And so uh, subtlety is his craft. Uh, his specialty is religion. And so subtlety in religion is, uh, is something that you can expect from his religion. Interesting about that statement made by the Pope, where he clearly indicated that atheists um, can be redeemed, can be saved. Okay, so there you have somebody who does not believe in God. They have a religion where they are their own God, and they can be saved. Now, interesting, the Vatican was quick to uh, the next day offer a clarification, an explanatory note. It, it was not a retraction, and that's important. It was an explanatory note. Uh, Thomas Rosica, a Vatican spokesman, came out the next day and, and quoted from their official doctrine that those who know about the Catholic Church cannot be saved if they refuse to enter or remain in her. That was his statement. Okay, and that is a, uh, uh, a pretty close quote of section 846 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Uh, interesting, he also quoted uh, section 847 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church that said, Those who, through no fault of their own, do not know the gospel of Christ and his church, but sincerely seek God, and moved by grace, try to do his will, as it is known through the dictates of conscience, can attain eternal salvation. Okay? That is the official doctrine of the Catholic Church. Well, I'll tell you what, we're Interesting. Gonna, hold, on, hold on just a minute. Hold your thought on that, because that seems to be contradictory to what the Pope said, but it is a clarification, explanatory note. Let's talk about that when we come back on the other side. Okay, Ed? Okay. All right. We're with uh, Edward Henry today, author of Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great. And we're going to solve some more mysteries uh, when we return in just one minute. Stay with us, won't you? Hello, Tex Mars here again. You know, I'm looking at this great book, Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great. It's a big book. I'll tell you, it's not something you're going to put in your back pocket. It's a very large format book, twice as big as the normal size book. And I suppose it must be, oh, around 375 pages or so. Very documented. It's got a great index in the back. And I'll tell you, I spent a number of nights with this book. Uh, and uh, my personal copy has a lot of uh, little notes in it and underlinings and things like that. So you can see it was a very valuable resource to me uh, in my writings and my thinking. So everything in here is documented, though. Now, Edward Henry has a great mind and he can write novels or anything he wants to write but in this case it's for the lay person but he is an attorney and he makes his case i'll tell you uh he'd <laughs> he'd be winning in a, in a if he held, held this before the supreme court that is unless they were a bunch of uh, catholics in which case they may not be listening much but he but he does a great job of showing how judaism and catholicism are essentially one and the same 
Now, you may think the Jews have a total different system and that, that Catholicism is not with, uh, within a thousand miles of what the rabbis are teaching. But you may be amazed. And there's a reason why uh, Pope Benedict wore that uh, Dagon, the fish god headpiece, with a Jewish star of David on it. Yeah, that's right. He, with the Jewish star of David, he wore that. And I think it was uh, symbolizing what he really is. But in any case, I want you to have your copy of this book. I think it's going to give you many nights of study and reflection. Uh, and, and you'll just thank God that he has sent this book uh, into your life. Because I don't know of any other book like it. Now, I know of uh, Alexander Hislop's great classic, The Two Babylons. But this does The Two Babylons, well, one up, because it also shows you the Judaism that's involved. And my personal opinion is to take the two Babylons, read it, and you'll really be rewarded. And then come back to this book and read this one on top. And then let me tell you, you will know more about the Catholic Church probably than virtually every priest. Now, I have worked with Catholic priests uh, in the Air Force uh, many times, and uh, I know a little bit about them and such. And I know that uh, they don't really know a lot about their religion that's the, just the truth I suspect that Edward Henry could pass a test uh, and become a Catholic priest if he wanted to he knows more than uh, than the priests do themselves but you can know more too you can know amazing things about Babylon the Great because the Catholic Church is Babylon the Great and amazingly Judaism is also Babylon the Great so I want you to have this book for $25 for $25, please also send $5 for shipping and handling, a total of $30, and send it to us at Power of Prophecy, 1708 Patterson Road, P-A-T-T-E-R-S-O-N Road, Austin, Texas, 78733. Now you can go on our website, that would be powerofprophecy.com, or simply textmars.com. i make sure you spell my name right, nobody ever does, but... <laughs> Even some of my best friends seem to misspell it sometime. It was T-E-X-E. See there? You're already missing it, weren't you? Okay. T-E-X-E-M-A-R-R-S dot com. And uh, you can uh, also phone us, of course. During the work week, just phone us at toll free 1-800-234-9673. 1-800-234-9673. And ask the friendly receptionist, say, hey, I'd like that book about Babylon the Great, solving the mystery. I don't want to, uh, don't, don't want you to forget that top part of the title. This isn't just about Babylon the Great. This is solving the mystery of Babylon the Great. Now let's return to our regular program. We've seen now about the Jesuits and, uh, how, uh, evidently his, uh, according to the head of the atheist here in America, uh, the Pope has done a great thing. He is, his religious and philosophical diversity is expanding. <laughs> and uh, he's, it's quite heartening. I mean, the, the, when you're honored by the atheists, I think that's really something, uh, Edward Henry, don't you? That's quite an accomplishment for a religious leader. Yeah, you know, I remember Elijah in the Bible, you know, he had to put up with the Baal. They were worshiping Baal, the, the Jews were at that time. Mm -hmm. And he said, how long will you halt between... Two opinions. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people answered him not a word, it says. The people answered him not a word. So evidently, most of the people, I don't think they even understood what they what he was talking about. I really believe they thought that Baal was the same as God. And that's sort of what we have now, isn't it? When you, I get so many letters from uh, Catholic faithful, wonderful people. And they, they admit to the fault of the Catholic Church, but they say, well, we put up with it. We're O-line Catholics. We don't like it. But it is ordained by God. It's the only church. And it, something is wrong with that concept. Do you think I'm uh, being too picky or too narrow, uh, Ed? Uh, no, no. We're being appropriately narrow and appropriately picky. And uh, just as Jesus was, uh, you know, he did, he did not compromise on his doctrines either. And neither should we. Uh, so you're absolutely correct. The, um, 
you know, the, the, the Roman Catholic Church has a very, very broad scope for salvation. And as the Pope's statement indicates, to include even atheists. So virtually everybody, with the, it's a free-for-all in the Roman Catholic Church. They want it very inclusive. It is not narrow at all. And as we know, straight is the gate and narrow is the way uh, to the kingdom of heaven. But wide is the gate to destruction. And so they, they created a very wide gate to include everybody, including the atheists. So um, they, they've got a wide way. To so destruction. They can bring so many people in that wide way then. Well, now you've yes. got to, you've got to, let me let me mention your book. We, we're not offering it, but I want to tell people about it. The Anti Gospel. Now, how th that is a book that actually tells people what salvation is and how they can they can be rewarded with salvation. It's it's a it's, right. a, one, it's a wonderful book. The Anti Gospel. A lot a lot of material in there. You expose a lot of uh, false teachings in churches and uh, her heresies, but the most important thing about that book, I think, is you tell people how they can be saved. You tell them what the gospel is. In explaining what the gospel is not, <laughs> you're also showing the greatness of the true gospel. The anti-gospel is the name of that. How can people get that book, Ed? Uh, it's available on Amazon. Um, it's available on Lulu. Uh, you just type in the anti-gospel. It'll, it'll pop up uh, for Amazon. I think maybe the first listing. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, either one of those, you can uh, you can buy it on either one. Now you have a website too. People can can they go to that website, or would you prefer that they go to Amazon or Lulu dot com? Yes, the, the, yeah, the, you can go to the website. It's uh, uh, anti gospel dot com, I think. Okay. I can't remember. You never go to your own website. I mean, I do, but you just click on it. It's already there, you know. Yeah. I, I, I'm yeah, always... Uh, it's, yeah, it's, anti, it's antigospel.com. Okay. And it has all the information about the book. You can uh, look through it. You can actually connect to Google. actually has a... Uh, uh, you can look at... Uh, well, I think Amazon also does have a, a sample you can look through and, and see if... Uh, I have the entire table of contents in there. People can look at it. Now, the, the illustration, the artwork for the book, shows a skeleton praying. That's sort of unusual, isn't it? A skeleton praying on his knees. What's the meaning of that? Well, because the, the anti-gospel is, a, is, a, is truly an anti-gospel. And what it does is it offers a false salvation to those who truly are not saved. Mm. It is a false gospel. And so... We are dead in trespasses and sin. We are born speaking lies. And in order to be saved, you must be born again. You must be made alive by the Spirit of God. Those who are not born again are not saved, although they may be deceived into thinking they're saved. And so the, the depiction on the front, it depicts somebody who is dead in trespasses and sin, but thinks that they're saved, mm. and they've been deceived by this anti-gospel. Salvation comes only by the grace of God, only through faith in Jesus Christ. It is not of works, it is not of lineage, it is not of blood. You can only get to heaven by the grace of God. Jesus Christ died as a propitiation for our sin. That means he satisfied God and God had to be satisfied in order to punish sin. Sin must be punished. So he punished Christ in our stead, in our place. And if one believes in Jesus Christ, then they are imputed with the righteousness of Christ. So we who are saved have the righteousness of Christ. So in God's eyes, we are viewed legally righteous. Our sins are forgiven, they're wiped clean, and when he sees us, those who are saved, he sees the pure, sinless nature of Christ. At the same time, there was a legal transfer of our sins onto Christ. And so he took on our sins legally and was punished for our sins, and we take on his righteousness. It's a legal exchange. And it's very interesting, the anti-gospel, which flows from the Roman Catholic Church, which flows, and the Roman Catholic Church flows from Babylon, there are only two types of religions in the world. 
you have all of the many, many types of religions with their salvation by works, okay? And then you have the one religion, which is salvation by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ, where no works can merit salvation, where you are imputed with the righteousness of Christ. You don't come with your own righteousness. All of these other religions require that you come with your own righteousness. And there are even Protestants who take the view that you must be actually righteous. You must actually, in fact, de facto, be righteous in order to get to heaven. That is, that when Christ died, you are imparted with actual righteousness. Not legal righteousness, but actual righteousness. And the problem with that theology is that it blasphemes God. Because in the same way that they say that we're actually righteous, because it was a legal exchange, that means that Jesus Christ was actually sinful. And that cannot be. He was not actually sinful. He was made sin legally on our behalf, and he was punished for the sin that we committed legally, but he was not actually sinful, okay? Just as we cannot be actually righteous, it's a legal righteousness. And so the true gospel is a legal exchange. The false gospel is a de facto exchange. And the Roman Catholic Church is on board with that. It is part and parcel of the Roman Catholic Church to require actual righteousness, which is why they require penance, which they, and, and they have, they have a, an actual place that they punish people who aren't, aren't actually righteous enough. They call it purgatory after people die. And I explain all of this in, in, in detail uh, in the Anti-Gospel. It's, uh, it's almost 600 pages long. With uh, Point by point, I go through and authoritatively explain the Gospel and explain how it's been corrupted in the Protestant churches. Most Protestant churches teach a free will where man is of his own free will. He's no longer dead and trusted in sin, as the Bible says. A man of his own free will, without the regeneration of, of the Holy Spirit, can believe in Jesus. Where, in fact, the Bible makes it clear that we are drawn by the Father to Jesus. And without the Father drawing us, there can be no salvation. Okay, now let's, uh, well, well, by him. Okay, let's, let's, let's stop right there. That's a very important point. You must be drawn by God. So God reaches out to you, and there's nothing that you do to, to achieve this. It's not some kind of reward or something, but, but God is good to you, uh, and, and you're born again through faith in Him, right? Well, now let's take the Catholic doctrine, because the Pope evidently, you know, he must believe in the Catholic doctrine. There, there, I have over my bookshelf there, I read it at one time, did, a uh, an actual, uh, well, an investigative report on it, on the Catholic Catechism. But you mentioned that this Father Rosica uh, at the Vatican sort of clarified what the Pope said. Now, the, the, as I understand it, the Catholic Catechism says that Jews are our elder brothers. So they, they must not need Jesus. They're already our elder brothers in the faith, even though they don't have any faith in Christ, which is sort of strange. But the Muslims also are saved as long as they follow their own light, which, of course, would lead them not to Jesus, but to uh, Muhammad and Allah. So these two yeah. groups, the Catholic Church says, are saved. But then on the other hand, this is what I want to ask you. They always use this term. They say outside the Catholic Church, there is no salvation. But then they say if you're a Muslim or a, a Jew, you, you're already saved. Uh, so uh, can you clarify that for us a little bit? Yes. What you have here is, if you look at Section 847, I'm sorry, it would be... Um, now, we don't need to know the number. You're an attorney, but we're not, so <laughs> yeah. Yeah. tell us what it says. That's good enough, because that's a huge book, the Catechism. Right. Well, let's, I'm sorry, it's 846. Under 846, it says, hence, they could not be saved who, knowing that the Catholic Church was founded as necessary by God through Christ, would refuse to enter it or to remain in it. So, who is that? Who are those people who recognize the Roman Catholic Church for what it is and refuse to enter it? Wow. Who are those people that would refuse <laughs> I don't know knowing any. what the Catholic Church is? Well, the Buddhists, the Hindus, the... Muslims, the Jews, they don't recognize it for what it is, or they don't even consider That's it. That's right. You're absolutely right. The only people that recognize it for what it is 
are Christians. And so what the Roman Catholic doctrine is, it's, a ta- it's an attack on biblical Christianity. It is only the Christians who, according to Catholic doctrine, okay, are damned to hell. Mm. It is only the Christians. So we don't even get to we don't even I get to Christians. be Christians. I'm talking about true Protestants, not Roman Catholic, true Protestants who know what the Catholic Church is about, refuse to take part in it, okay, are true Protestants in the sense that they protest against the Catholic Church. They are, according to the Roman Catholic Church, damned to hell. However, they offer salvation to all the heathen religions, okay? It, it says uh, if the, the God is uh, in, in 842, section 842 of the Catechism, with regard to non-Christian religions, but all share a common destiny, namely God, His providence, evident goodness, and saving designs extend to all, okay? This is one of the sections that was not mentioned by Rosica was uh, uh, 842. The Pope used that then. He he basically said that atheists, as long as they do good you know good things, they're, they're nice people, they're nice neighbors, they believe in fixing the potholes <laughs> and, and uh, you know paying their taxes or whatever. Of course, that's becoming doubtful these days. A lot of people are mad at the IRS. But uh, in any case, uh, if an uh, atheist is relatively good, they're going to go to heaven, the Pope says. And he is and infallible. Pope, and, and by the way, the Pope's statement is consistent with Catholic, Catholic doctrine. If you look at the Constitution of the Church, which is a, comes from the assessment of the Council in Vatican II, they have statements in there that says the non-Christian, now what is meant by non-Christian, uh, may not be blamed for his ignorance of Christ and his church. Salvation is open to him also. Okay? Now, what does that mean? Well, an interpretation given by the Religious Tolerance Org, which is a Roman Catholic catechism website, says this statement would seem to include the possibility that seekers after God may attain salvation even though they have not concluded that God exists. This statement indicates that even some agnostics and atheists could be saved and attain heaven if they sincerely sought this Christian God. So what the Pope said is not so radical outside the Catholic doctrine. It's just unknown to most. That's all. Uh, he let out a secret. And the secret is, the Catholic, under the Catholic doctrine, virtually everybody is saved except for Protestant Christians who know what the Catholic Church is about and refuse to enter it because they know what it's about. Hmm. So the, 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 uh, they've got the big brothers, that's uh, the Catholics, that's the Jews, but we're not even little brothers then, right? I suppose I'm just I'm just being a smart like on that one. Uh, forgive me. But now let's let's talk about something that's very strange. You know that the Pope also made another statement. Uh, Ed, he said just this last week that he had to contend with a gay lobby inside the Vatican. He said we have a gay lobby inside the Vatican. Please pray for me because of the gay lobby. He was basically saying, well, I'm not gay, but. There's a gay lobby in the Vatican, and I have to fight with it. Why, why, he's a pope. Why didn't he just say, "Okay, you get you gays, you're out. You know, you're you're stricken from being a priest." I guess it has to do with the fact that the Catholic doctrine, the Catechism, the book that they uh, put together. Uh, in fact, Pope Benedict was the one who put it together when he was a cardinal. Uh, pope John Paul II approved it, but it says that you can be a gay a homosexual, and become a priest. And I understand the statistics say that are some 75% of all Catholic seminarians are gay. Now, 75 I guess it varies from a seminary to seminary, but three-fourths of all Catholic priests that are going in now, uh, seminarians, are gay. But they say as long as you don't actually do the act, you can be gay. So the Pope says he's got all these gay priests. It's, he calls it a gay lobby. So I, I'm wondering what should he do about that, uh, you know, it, to, to please the Bible, but also to please his own um, catechism. You know, it, it, it's interesting that they, they they say as long as you don't do the act, it's okay. Well, a murderer is a murderer because they committed murder. Mm. A sodomite is a sodomite because that's what they do. <laughs> it's a description of what they do. Yeah. And it's... It's pure sophistry for them to suggest 
that these priests don't do what they are. They certainly do, and the evidence shows that those who are sodomites, is, it, it is one of the most uncontrollable urges that they have. Mm. And one thing about the sodomites, they, they're not just are they with adults, but they have a proclivity for children. They have an attraction for children. There was a young man who was dying of AIDS. He was on John Ankerberg, and this is going back, I think, 20 years ago, and I saw it on television. And he was within weeks of dying, and he was a, uh, a, a, a Christian. He was saved, but he had lived in the homosexual community. He was a homosexual before he was saved. And uh, he made a, 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 a statement which was quite controversial. And he said that what homosexuals really want is they want the softness of a female, but the, with the male genitalia. And so ultimately, what these what the sodomite community wants is children. They want children, and that's what they're going for. And so, a this is not surprising when you look at the behavior, and, and it has been publicized uh, in the news about the behavior of these Roman Catholic priests with their pedophilia, pederasty. Mm-hmm. Well, now Pope Benedict, here's here's something for you too, just to consider. Uh, I like to throw out these things just for a man like you to consider, uh, Ed. But uh, according to the Scottish Daily Record, that's a newspaper over in Scotland, Pope Benedict, when he was Pope, he's still alive, of course. He's still at the Vatican. He's the Emeritus, Pope Emeritus. But let me read this to you from the Sunday Mail and the Scottish Daily Record. It says, The Pope has revealed that he now believes it is acceptable for condoms to be used by male prostitutes. Well, what, <laughs> didn't he say it's okay then for... I mean, what is this? Male prostitutes? That would seem to be a, a violation of God's law to be a male prostitute. But he said it's acceptable for condoms to be worn. It, it, yeah, it, it's, it seems very... This is kind of isn't it? This is crazy. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, well, now this gay lobby, maybe some of these guys were male prostitutes. I don't. I don't know. But they say that right down from the Vatican itself in Rome... Just uh, six blocks away, they have a place where they have a, a weekly gay party just for priests. They do bring in all these male prostitutes, and they say there's hundreds of priests that come from all over the city, and even, you know, from uh, the United States and other countries, to this gay party. Evidently, uh, homosexuality is one of the major problems, and the Pope has identified it as a problem. But if it's a problem, his own doctrine approves it. Is, am I wrong in that? Uh, well, it um, it seems to us, based on what they said. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's an amazing. They have, uh, remember, they're, they're, theirs is the wide way. They have a wide way, all mm. inclusive. Yeah. Wow. Well, you know, back in the Mystery Babylon, they they had a a lot of pederasty, a lot of pedophilia. Uh, I, I understand that Semiramis uh, even married her own son uh, when her husband, the, the king, died. She married her own son, and he became the king then. So there was incest there. But uh, it, it's just a, a horrible situation within the Catholic Church. Well, you know, we've got about three minutes. What would you suggest for a Catholic? Uh, I mean, some say, well, I'm, I'm remaining straight. I'm remaining okay. Uh, I don't accept this Catholic Church, this Pope even. But I do believe in the Catholic Church. I don't know how you can reject a Pope but accept the church, do you? Well, it's spiritual bondage. Yeah. So, those that are in the Catholic Church, they're, they're headed for destruction. Mm. God calls them out of the Catholic Church. If one is in the Catholic Church and is saved, they won't remain in the Catholic Church. Ah. God saves them, they will leave the Catholic Church. They will see it for what it, what it is. Yeah, that's a good point. There. Eyes will be open. The scales will fall from their eyes, and they will look around, and they will realize that these idols that are in the Catholic Church um, are a violation of God's laws. The Catholic Church itself in, it announces to the world through its idolatry uh, that it is anti-Christian. Well, I'll tell you, I, I will... So, 
I want to say that I'm, we've only got about a minute left here, but I want to say that I'm very thankful that God brought you out of the Catholic Church. And, and really, uh, you know, I, I like your book, The Anti-Gospel, because basically you say that it's God that saves us, not our own works. And, uh, you've been doing a wonderful work for Him in, in writing these books. So, uh, Ed, Henry, praise God for you. And thank you very much for being a, on our program today here at Power of Prophecy. Thank you, Doug. And would you stay with me just a minute? I'd like to say something after the program. I'd like to talk with you just a minute. Well, folks. Sure. We've had another, uh, a program here of Power of Prophecy. I want to mention our conference coming up July the 9th, is it? Oh, I'm sorry, the 6th, two days after July 4th. Okay, July 6th in Austin, Texas. Hey, call us at 1-800-234-9673. And we'll tell you more about it, but we're going to have fun. We're going to absolutely have a ball. We've got uh, great uh, uh, speakers. Uh, hey, my namesake is coming here, Jim Mars. A lot of people think that I am Jim or he's me or something. <laughs> We're going to get on stage together. We're going to be different people. Uh, but we've got a lot of great speakers. Yeah, my personal physician is going to come and tell you, you may not like what he said, but I don't like it either, about Obamacare, the danger to America that is Obamacare. We have Susie Hupp, and bless her heart, both her parents were, were murdered by uh, a crazed killer in Colleen at that cafeteria shooting. But she... She is doing a great work. She's written a book called One Woman's Fight Against Gun Control. And, of course, we have uh, uh, my good friend, uh, Galen Ross, who's going to tell you about, uh, well, who killed JFK. It's the 50th anniversary. I hope you'll come because we're going to have some great times here at Power Plus. Did I forget any speaker, Jerry? Who? Oh, the mystery guest. Yes, we're going to have a mystery guest. <laughs> I'm not, I can't tell you who that is. Uh, I hope he shows up. I might have to speak twice. Uh, I'm not sure, but a mystery guest. Hey, we're even going to have R2-D2, the robot from Star Wars. He's going to stop by and say hello to everybody. We're going to have a great time. Folks, it's only $70. It's an all-day event. Uh, it's at the, at the, uh, the Hilton Hotel. They're only charging like $99 a night. You don't even have to stay there. You can just come there for this session. $70, that'll buy your lunch. We're going to have a free lunch for everybody. So be sure to come, won't you? Hey, you need a place to go uh, July 4th and maybe rest up from the, the uh, going zone, your barbecues or what have you. But come down to Austin, Texas and see us for the, I guess it's the second annual Liberty and Truth Conference. Liberty and Truth Conference. Call us, 1-800-234-9673. We'll register you right up. We'll take care of you. I want you to come. Wanda will be there, and she and I will be shaking hands. Might even hug your neck. Who knows? It, it has happened. Okay? Well, until next week, friends, this is Tex Mars saying, Tune in and discover the power of prophecy. I've looked into this briefly before, but there's, I think there's a few more points that I need to raise. But the Jesuits, the Vatican, the Catholic Church, Christendom, that is a very, very powerful force in this world. And it is a tool of Satan, which is very sad because it dresses itself up in such light. And uh, again, it's the same old false trick that they're, they're using. Uh, masquerading as light, but in fact, um, they're actually complete and utter darkness. And uh, the rituals that take place as part of, you know, what this is, this institution, are actually satanic in nature. Um, so let's look, firstly look into the IHS logo. Now, this logo you will find in many different churches, such as the Church of England and other churches Many, many churches are in some way affiliated, even if they're Protestant churches, uh, especially with the Church of England over here in the UK, they will have the IHS somewhere 
or rather blatantly everywhere, all over the prayer cushions, all over the lecterns, everywhere. And the IHS is a deception, unfortunately. It's the Is Isis Horus set. Many things, guys, many things. This logo, although it looks simple, is encoded with so much occult. And I'm sorry, but if they were really for Christ, nah. This is the Black Sun, just to remind us all. The Black Sun, which is the gate. The Black Sun of death. It's the eclipse. Now, we all know that the Black Sun is a very bad thing. So then it shouldn't surprise us that it goes so far as to put the three nails that crucified Christ on that Black Sun. Remember, the sun went black when Christ was crucified. So what does this tell you? This is a curse. Nothing good, a curse, part of the curse. And we've got these wavy and straight lines which refer to many different things, but we're all talking here about tones, we're talking about male and female, we're talking about the androgynous one, which they call the alpha and the omega. Alpha here and the omega here. So this pillar is male and this is a female symbol. So we've got the androgynous uh, spectrum of this this god here along with this when you flip this logo upside down it says s-h-i-t of course we're talking about the gate the ring the anus hole the manhole the birth of bs and this, what, what that is, is the gate, as I said. So that's why you've got S-H-I-T, because we're literally talking about crap, the birth of crap and the beast, the black sun beast. This is so wicked, guys, so wicked, and it gets much, much deeper. Also, if we look into, interestingly, into the word S-H-I, in Chinese is a masculine and feminine word, and Chinese means time. Now, why does it mean time? S-H-I, she. The woman, Isis, we're talking about here. We're talking about all of the same thing. It all leads back to the same thing. So why are we talking about time? Because this false messiah breaks time. Brings the sword to conquer. Just like Samson between the two pillars, you see the sword is going between the two pillars, of course, representing the breaking of the link between those two pillars. And that is, of course, all to do with the recreation of this reality. The, if you like, the pillars that hold up the reality that we are in. And that is the destruction of which and the recreation into their new world, which is what their false messiah will do. And also remember that is actually an eight because it's a H. So instead of seeing the H there, imagine with me for a second that you've got the eight because H is the eighth letter of the alphabet. Now what is eight? Eight is infinity. The sword going into the stone, into the infinity and breaking the infinity chain link. Remember, infinity is the chain link, almost like the fallen are held in in some way and that needs to be broken. Of course, the same thing is the story of Samson, the son of Sam references we're talking here, which is a picture of the Antichrist, of what the Antichrist will do in the pushing down of the two pillars, and that is exactly what that is representing there. And the whole thing itself is the gate. That is a hell's gate. It's Ishtar gate. It's all the same thing. And obviously, our real Messiah took on that role and became that same Samson-type figure. He became the curse, and he defeated the prison that we are trapped in. And that's what you've got to remember through all of this. The false Christ, the false Messiah, is going to follow a similar kind of pattern as the one that Christ fulfilled to become the curse and to defeat it and bring us to real life instead of this same old rubbish, uh, looping rubbish that just keeps going round and round. Some of you may laugh at this one, but I'm going to tell you it anyway, because what I find interesting is when you break up words, you find out a lot about 
you know, just certain hints about what they potentially mean. Now, Vatican means there was a certain territory in antiquity known as Asia Vaticanus, and it's in reference to the Vatican Hill, which takes its name from the Latin word Vaticanus. Vaticanus. Let's have a look into, let's break it down like we usually do, because it gives you certain hints, and these things really don't lie, because it all comes back to the same thing. The word Vatic means describing or predicting what will happen in the future. From Latin, vatis, i.e. prophet. So, vatic means prophet. Arnus, anus, which means, late Middle English from Latin, originally a ring. So there, what you've got, we've got the prophet of the ring. Prophet of the anus hole. Interesting, interesting. Very interesting. Of course, when we're talking about the ring, it's the same thing as this, which is the gate. Again, the, the ring of fire, the black sun, the ring, prophet of the ring. Um, literally hell's gatekeepers, guys. Literally hell's gatekeepers who have stolen the powerful words of our Messiah to push their evil, wicked agenda. It's the same as like the Ring movie you had several years ago now about this ring. Again, the gate, showing it as the gate. It's exactly the same thing. It's the ring. It's the gate. It's Hell's Gate. And the anus hole being just like the same thing as the aperture. Just the same as that video I uploaded where you, you get that lady, the performer, coming out of that uh, spiral like aperture. And... You, can, you don't need much imagination to see that it's kind of representing that same anus hole um, shutter thing right there. Eat me. All right. Drink me. <laughs> the Eucharist, which is a completely satanic doctrine of consuming, eating the flesh and drinking the literal blood, transubstantiation. Eat me. All right. Drink me. Eat me. All right. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> what did you say? Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood. So this is implying that they, um, this is actually his flesh and blood we are consuming, just like in the Catholic Church. Um, that is a blasphemy, for it, my friends. Um, this is cannibalism, completely upside down doctrine uh, in what Christ meant by remembering him, not by eating or feasting on his flesh. Now, why? It's not only just a blasphemy, but why are they doing it? There's always reasons behind this. It's not just not just the case that they want to blaspheme. It's feasting on the flesh and blood of the beast. It is their version of the feast of the Lamb of Isis. And that's why the Eucharist looks like that spherical wafer with IHS on it. And it is literally representing taking in, eating the flesh of the lamb of Isis. And they, what I notice in these churches is they'll do the whole ritual under the big stained glass window of the false Jesus which is the image of the beast, because it isn't the real Christ at all. It's representing the image of the beast, the Lamb of Isis, all of that. Um, and you're literally consuming the flesh and blood of this idol, complete idol. If you're in the Catholic Church, if you go to these things, I really, really would recommend getting out. And I really, really would definitely recommend not taking the Eucharist and not confessing to any man in a box because we do not confess to other men. So as I said, Samson, the role of Samson to bring down the two pillars. Just like we keep seeing over and over again, the sword in the stone, the time, the defeating of the dragon, the false Jesus defeating time, 
all of the same thing. The dragon representing time, the serpent, um, and just like I was showing the other day in the video. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan. Stronger than time. Stronger than time. Whoso pulleth out this sword of this stone and anvil is rightwise king born of England. <laughs> And they literally took the truth of Christ in like this Codex Vaticanus, omitted parts in the Codex Vaticanus, admitted parts that didn't agree with the Catholic Church. Look, it stopped at the book of Hebrews, at Hebrews 9.14, a very convenient stopping point for the Catholic Church, since God forbids their priesthood in Hebrews 10 and exposes the Mass as totally useless. Christ Mass, completely Vatican-based festival, Christmas. Again, probably that same feasting thing, the Mass being the feast. Guys, totally evil, inverted, nothing about the birth of Christ. Christ was not born then, and it is, it's about the other one. It's about the whole Nimrod thing. And what I love about this site is they've put heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Guys, at the end of the day, they can do all they like um, in trying to hijack Christ and head towards their evil means. But inadvertently, they've actually fulfilled the truth that we know of the Messiah. They've tried desperately to cover him, hide him, change him. Uh, write it in very difficult to understand Latin for the general public, try and keep it uh, under wraps in their varying ways. And they, even the Guy Fawkes plot, guys, the Guy Fawkes plot, I think, probably had something to do with a Jesuit, a Jesuit plot to, to kill Guy Fawkes because Guy Fawkes was trying to kill King James just a few years before the, the King James Bible came out. And they do not want you to know Christ on a personal level. They do not. They're even saying that recently, don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. The end times revelation is about the birth of all this stuff. And that is what they are heading towards. That is what they want. And that is what they are vicars of. They are not vicars of the real Christ, my friends. They are vicars of the anti-Christ. They are the brotherhood of Saturn. And please, please, stay away from their institutions because that is the primary point where this great deception will be advocated is in the Jesuit controlled religious institutions.